Good afternoon. Welcome to the 53rd LRT, hosted by Titan Industries. And um, I'm very grateful to Dinesh and Sridhar. And I must say that the 31st LRT was hosted by Titan when Rajaram was uh, the steward of the legal department in the secretarial function. Now he is, uh, his successor is Dinesh and uh, Sridhar. They have been actively taking part in this, organizing this event. And uh, thank you all very much. Um, as you all know that today the speaker is going to be Shamnad. When he walked in, I asked him, where is your guitar? <laughs> so I'm so happy, Shamnad. I know that he had a lot of constraints in uh, making this date possible. And um, somehow he managed and juggled the various appointments and sort of made it possible to have this function today. Thank you, Shamnad. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. I have uh, a pleasant task to perform. I have uh, Professor Jungi Kim. Will you please stand up and look at the audience? Hello. Professor Jungi Kim is from Seoul City, South Korea. And he is a professor. And he is a specialist in international arbitration. And it is our good fortune that Jungi happened to be here as a visiting professor at National Law School, um, teaching the students there some finer aspects of international arbitration. And um, we also have Professor Ashok Patil, again from National Law School. He's a person who is driving uh, online mediation for consumer disputes. And I happen to be on the advisory board. And uh, I really see very good work being done by Ashok and his team. And uh, thank you, Ashok, for making it possible. And thank you very much, Jungi, for being thank here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. The, the other announcement that I want to make is that tomorrow at Grand Thornton Bagmane Tech Park, there is a fraud film festival. The International Anti-Fraud Awareness Week has arrived. And the much-awaited Fraud Film Festival is just a day away. Seats are limited, so please take Maya's help and register with Vidya Rao and head to Bagmane Tech Park if you have the time. And the date and venue is um, um, Bangalore on uh, 14th November, that is tomorrow. All the other details I can provide after the program. And if you want me to mail the full program, uh, just ask Maya to mail you if you are interested, because we decided not to mass mail that program to everybody, OK? Though it has been sent once before by Vidya. The 54th LRT will be, please note the date, on the 12th of December. 12th of December at ITC Gardenia in the Magnolia Room. And this will be hosted by Duff and Phelps. Duff and Phelps will be hosting the 54th LRT on 12th of December. When uh, Shamnal talked about uh, law and storytelling, I was very curious to know. And I stumbled upon this PhD paper um, from a student, LLM student in Stanford. And um, she has actually quoted an anti-mafia judge in Italy called I hope I pronounced it properly, Gianrico Cara Figlia. He says, at the end of the day, what is it that we do in court? All of us, I mean policemen, prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, we all tell stories. We take the raw material contained in the evidence, gather it together, and give it a structure and meaning in stories that present a plausible version of past events. And that's an amazing, I thought, summary. And then this lady who has actually published this paper, she goes on to say, lawyers don't talk much about stories. We then look at analytical and objective aspects of a case. 
Early in our careers, we learned to think like lawyers and to embrace the idea of reasonable man while we refer to the witness as a testimony, witness's statement as a testimony, a client's confidence, an advocate's argument, a negotiated contract, a judicial opinion, etc., etc. Perhaps, she says, the closest we come to admitting how integral stories are to law and our work as lawyers is an academic reference to narrative. The word narrative has an emotional distance, a bloodless ring that is distinct from that of the word story, which connotes engagement and immediacy. So it's an interesting paper on law and story. And I think without much ado, I'll hand over the floor to Shamnath to do some storytelling. Over to you, Shamnath. Great to be back here um, for another round of the LRT. I think the last time we were here, we've spoken about creativity and the law. Yes, sir. So it's all, as you can see, the themes are all intertwined because you can't really tell good stories without some bit of creativity. So I hope uh, there will be some resonant themes uh, from the last time. I want to thank uh, Titan uh, for hosting it again uh, this time. Um, and this time we were actually, the, you know, Prasanna sort of reached out to me once he saw that we were going to do a full-fledged conference on law and storytelling in December uh, in Delhi. So for any of you uh, who are free to come to Delhi or in Delhi, December 8th, we have an, a full-day conference just on law and storytelling, uh, going to be keynoted by uh, Javed Akhtar. Because um, uh, 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 Javed Saab has also agreed to do a script for us uh, for the longest time, I, I, I run a nonprofit called IDIA, and we train underprivileged students, uh, get them into the top law schools, and uh, it's an idea of increasing diversity within the law schools and also promoting access to legal education for the underprivileged and building up community leaders uh, from within um, underprivileged sections so that they can then advocate their causes um, and we can have them assume leadership positions. Um, so as part of this, uh, we do a conference every year. As part of IDEA, we do a conference every year. And this year, the conference is going to be uh, in Delhi around this theme. And as soon as I sent out the note, Prasanna immediately um, uh, reached out and said, do you want to do a pre-run? And I said, well, I wasn't planning on speaking there. Uh, you know, Akhtar and many others, the lawyers and the others who tell stories in court are going to be speaking. But now that you asked, maybe I'll, I'll you know, share some thoughts. Because at, coincidentally, at that point, we were also uh, unleashing our new pedagogy uh, across some of the law schools. Um, and this pedagogy had to do with making the law a little more exciting because for those of you who have gone to law school, uh, and maybe there are exceptions, um, but, but very few, but for the last, vast majority of us, classes were immensely boring. Uh, and we thought a, a good way of exciting the study of law is uh, through storytelling, one, uh, but also to look beyond just thinking like a lawyer, look beyond the case method. Uh, the case method was invented more than 100 years ago by uh, uh, I'm sure some of you will know his name. It's interestingly called Christopher Columbus Langdell. He's a dean at the Harvard Law School. Uh, <clears throat> and at the Harvard Law School, he found out that till then, the law was being taught in a fairly boring, instructional um, manner where uh, just taught as a series of propositions, you know. This is what the law says, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and nobody took the law seriously as an academic endeavor. Uh, so in order to vest it with a little more scientific rigor, Langdell came up with what he called the, uh, the case method. The case method is you take a case and you sort of, for want of a better word, you reverse engineer it, you break it apart. You see the process of reasoning deployed, you see the arguments that went in, and you see how the legal proposition came into being through that case. Uh, <clears throat> and this is very good for common law countries because uh, a lot of a law is built through case law. So if you understand the dynamics of how a legal proposition evolved through case law, uh, then the argument was that um, you would become a much better lawyer because you know how the law is being built. <clears throat> of course, today we have statutes and we have the onset of the regulatory lawyer, the policy lawyer. So it's not enough just to uh, be thorough with case law and doctrinal case law, but you really have to step beyond, way beyond that. And so we thought the time had come to move from the case method that Langdell had invented more than 100 years ago uh, to what we call the case plus method. Uh, and this was mainly because our own scholars, you know, we educated, like I said, a number of underprivileged children across the law schools. Uh, and initially, our focus was really on 
just putting them into the law schools. We thought the biggest battle was clearing that entrance that we call CLAT, which is now more of an arbitrary exam than anything else. You toss a coin, you get in. Um, <clears throat> it's on the wrong side, you don't make it, right? Um, it's fairly, it's, it's a very badly executed, badly implemented, badly conceptualized exam. But for better or worse, that's the only filter we effectively have uh, for the Indian law schools. You can't do what Harvard and Yale and some of the others do because they base it on the school grades and personal interviews. If you base it on personal interviews in India, all politicians' kids would be in the top law schools. <clears throat> so we need some kind of an objective filter, and this seems to be the obje only objective filter. So we trained our children to crack this filter and to make it to the leading law schools. And then we found out that we were in for a big surprise because uh, that's just half the battle won. Uh, a large part of the battle was really law school. Uh, law schools weren't doing their job. They were mass producing uh, lawyers in a factory mode. They were technically ticking off all the boxes and saying we comply with Bar Council Regulation X and Y and UGC Regulation X and Y, which means you teach all these subjects in a fairly mechanized, uh, <clears throat> um, rote learning manner. Uh, but have we created critically thinking lawyers? Have we designed a curricula to stimulate creativity in the law schools uh, to produce leaders of tomorrow? I, I think the answer is no. Uh, at least in the vast majority of law schools, there are exceptions. Uh, and so we then decided that we will start training our own scholars and augmenting their legal education. And for that, we needed to have some idea of what a good lawyer was going to look like. Because unless you ask the question, what makes a good lawyer, uh, you can't really design any pedagogy for producing a good lawyer. Uh, that's idea A. And uh, we put in kids into law schools every year, a number of or from various kinds of underprivileged backgrounds, uh, children of farmers, construction workers, um, blind children. Um, and many of them have made it to the top three to five national law schools in the country. We have about 80 of them studying at the law schools. We graduated three batches of students. means approximately 25 of our scholars now are fully graduated lawyers, some working in law firms, some litigation lawyers, some doing human rights work, some trying to become judges and civil servants. Uh, that's the map of where our scholars typically come from. These are some of our success stories. Uh, both graduated students, one decided he wants to have nothing more to do with the law because he just became so good at IT that he's now coding and making applications and he's building an application around artificial intelligence and law. Uh, and he's now hired by a Berlin co company in Berlin, Donny. Um, the boy was thrown out of school way back because he couldn't pay his school fees. That's how we found him. Uh, and then he went to the Gujarat Law School and now decided that his talents are more weird towards technology. Uh, Kartika is from very close by here. She's now working with AZB, went to NUJS in Calcutta. Um, so, so when we decided what are the qualities that we want in lawyers, in the leading lawyers, how do we make legal leaders, uh, and we identified a couple of attributes, um, and we abbreviated it to CHAMPS. Uh, we figured out that most leading lawyers uh, were creative, that's a C, were holistic in their orientation, were not symptomatic, but looked at a problem holistically. Um, and so we put the H in there. They were altruistic, and this is what the law was always supposed to be about. You're supposed to help somebody else. Uh, so altruism is a large part of this. Uh, mavericks we wanted, uh, because we wanted people that would challenge established convention. Um, and we wanted problem solvers, because that's what the law was about. The law was always about problem solving, uh, never about increasing problem increasing or exacerbating problem, which unfortunately is what the law has come to become today, which is where we want to prolong disputes because uh, it gives us more bread and butter on the table. And uh, so we want to take it back to problem solving. Um, so the case plus, so this is the revised pedagogy uh, that we decided to design, which is we'll take uh, Langdell's method of just analyzing a case and go into a case plus methodology to prepare the modern day lawyer, because the modern day lawyer cannot just be well versed in the doctrine of the law through case law. Uh, but effectively, I think, uh, given that this legal norms today are not built in vacuum, uh, but are built uh, through an interface with a number of other disciplines. You can't be a good intellectual property lawyer without knowing technology, science, economics, uh, psychology, the psychology of creativity. Uh, similarly, in any one of your fields, I mean, you take any one of the fields that you practice, uh, your day-to-day -day practice revolves around, you can't be a good corporate lawyer without having an understanding of economics, uh, finance, accounts, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so how do we create that lawyer who's adept in all these disciplines? How do we create someone who's interdisciplinary by nature? Uh, and the law is inherently an interdisciplinary discipline, and that's the beauty of law. 
a lot of us got attracted to law uh, because of the fact that we could interface with a lot of other disciplines. Uh, so I was personally interested in science and tech, so my area of specialization became intellectual property. Uh, and so, with, uh, and I guess with many of you, some of my friends were interested in music, they went into copyright law, others were interested in sports, uh, and I see Nandan sitting here, sports law. Uh, and so this is a perfect vehicle for us to indulge uh, in our multifarious pursuits uh, outside the strict domain of the law. I mean, we pull it back into the law, right? So it's inherently interdisciplinary, and we wanted to bring that out. Uh, you have to link a lot for the law, so we focus a lot on linked learning. Um, polycentrism, you use one central focus of inquiry, but then you branch out into different, and I'll demonstrate a little bit of it as we go through the Donahue story. Uh, and of course, collaborative learning, because uh, we focus on this a lot given that uh, most law schools educate for the atomized lawyer. That's a single lawyer. You know, you go on the, the, the person is taught to just understand the law and work with the law alone. But today that never happens in the workplace. You have to collaborate. You have to, and, and a lot more comes out of good collaboration. Clinics, uh, a, a large part of the focus also has to be uh, for students that have some understanding of how law, law works on the ground. And which is where I think uh, the bridge between the practitioners uh, and legal academics and law students uh, need to increase a lot. Uh, and I know that uh, I think Ashok here is doing some with this consumer clinic there, uh, trying to integrate the practice of law with uh, the theoretical underpinnings of the law uh, and, and taking clinics forward. <clears throat> so the other thing that we emphasize on is back to basics. I mean, we seem to have forgotten the basics. I had this professor in law school uh, who taught us corporate law, and I see a couple of my classmates here as well, and they will uh, 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 endorse me on this, uh, Professor Padmanava Pillay, who taught us corporate law, uh, but his uh, case law always veered between the late 1800s to the early 1900s. Uh, didn't budge beyond that, and we were uh, pretty pissed off uh, because at that time, you know, India was liberalizing, there was SEBI, there was all this cool stuff going on which we were reading about in the papers, and this man wouldn't touch any of that. Uh, he would go into Lee versus Lee, and Salomon versus Salomon, and <laughs> we cursed, we cribbed, uh, but then if I ask my friends who are all corporate uh, legal leaders today, did it help? And they say, well, you bet it did, because he laid down the foundation so thick and strong that we could basically build on top. Uh, today, you look at uh, law schools, uh, and you ask the student, what, do you, you know, what courses do you take? And they say, cyber law. And say, what is cyber law? Cyber law is nothing but foundational legal concepts applied to cyberspace. But does he want to study contract law? No, he doesn't pay attention. Does he want to study tort law? No, he doesn't want to. Despite the fact that if I take uh, you know, any kind of uh, a denial of service attack in cyber law terminology, uh, it comes very close to trespass. <laughs> it comes close to interference, tortious interference with property. But he doesn't want to know all of that. He likes the term denial of service. He likes Aadhaar, but he doesn't know that Aadhaar is about uh, data breaches. Again, goes back to a tort of privacy. And a tort of privacy, again, builds on the tort of negligence. Right? Uh, so they don't want the building blocks, they want the superstructures. And if you build the superstructure without the building blocks, you're going to crumble and fall. If you build this, uh, the building blocks and the basics, then you can easily build on top of it. And this is not just me saying it. I mean, you're one of the world's leading uh, creative geniuses. Uh, he's now in a, obviously in a <laughs> lot of negative publicity because of the way he's handled things. But nonetheless, we still think uh, that he's somebody uh, who's uh, definitely well-versed in a lot of the domains that he traverses, Elon Musk. Um, and somebody asked him, how do you learn so fast? Because the man knows uh, a hell of a lot of things about a lot of stuff. Right? Uh, so when somebody told when he wanted to build a rocket uh, mission to Mars, and somebody told him, well, you can't do it because the rocket's going to be too expensive, um, he went back and studied how rockets are made and then figured out a cheaper way of making a rocket. Uh, and so when they asked him, how do, you, how do you learn so much and how do you acquire so many different things in different domains, his answer was, well, knowledge is a sort of a semantic tree. Right? You have to understand the fundamental principles. You have to build the trunk. You have to build the trunk and the roots. And then the leaves will attach on their own. Uh, our focus, unfortunately, has been to plug on the leaves, but without the trunk and without the roots. Uh, and this is something we wanted to change. So we said, let's go back to basics. So let's pull out five fundamental basic cases and try and learn the law through that. Because if you understand those basics, then we can leave the students to build up on their own. I suspect it might be a good training methodology uh, for you in law firms and other workplaces as well when freshers come in to actually have this grounding, even though the law schools don't do too well, uh, so that then they can build on their own uh, and, um, and, and we create better lawyers. So now we come to the actual crux of this. Um, and uh, uh, but I wanted to, ah, oh, thank you. 
I wanted to integrate uh, all of this so that you get a bit of a background. Uh, but why law and storytelling? And I'll, inter I'll narrate, I'll start with a story, given that it's about law and storytelling. So many, many years, uh, not actually many, many years, but, but four or five years back, uh, I was not living in Bangalore, but we, our head office for idea was in Bangalore, and I had to keep coming. I was in Kodaikanal, and I had to keep coming to Bangalore. Um, and during that time, I would stay in a guest house. And there was this boy who was, uh, you know, uh, one of the people that helped out in the guest house, uh, swabbing, cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, at one point, uh, uh, they used to serve me lunch as well. Uh, there was lunch, and it was a very interesting vegetable. And I asked him, what is this? Uh, and uh, he said, this is uh, kundri. And I said, what is kundri? And he went back and he came back and he said, uh, ivy gourd. And I said, how do you know it's ivy gourd? And he said, well, I looked up Google. And I said, well, how do you know how to look up Google? He said, no, somebody gave me an old used smartphone and I figured out how to use it. So then I said, okay, to what class have you studied? And he said, well, I studied till class 10 and then I ran away from home because uh, my father had passed away and he had no money. He was on the Indo-Bhutan uh, border. Uh, it's a place called Jaigao. And uh, I said, are you interested in studying further? And he says, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, you know, I need to earn a living and I have to send some uh, money to my father's sister who's still there and who's still in the house and she's quite old. And I said, well, if you're interested in, in, in studying further, we can find a way. So he was almost 28 years old then. Uh, we put him back in class 11 uh, in Bangalore uh, and he studied, he ended up topping his class 12. Now he's doing his BCom second year and hopefully he'll take the law entrance uh, at some stage when he's ready for it. Uh, but as, uh, as a part of our exposure of these students, so he's, he's also part of IDA, as a part of exposure of these students to law, we try and show them what the law is. And, and one good way of doing that is through videos and uh, through interesting legal teleseries. And one of the things that I showed him was, uh, it's a six part series called The Jury. I don't know how many of you have seen it. Uh, I think it was the BBC that produced it. It's available free uh, on YouTube. Um, and so you can just, it's a six part series, brilliantly done. Uh, it's uh, about a, a, a Sikh child, uh, a Sikh boy, Ind Indian immigrants in the UK, uh, who was accused of killing his classmate, uh, who's British, uh, you know, a homegrown British boy. Uh, and the, the story underlying that was that there was a lot of bullying going on and the Sikh boy was being targeted by them. And uh, finally the question is, did he actually murder him? Um, and you have the jury there, you have the judge there, you have excellent legal arguments, and they walk you through all of that in a very interesting way. At the end of it, uh, the series, you still don't know whether he did it or not. He's acquitted. And so Basant, uh, this boy from Jaigaon, uh, who's not gone to law school, but with this very raw intelligence, uh, I asked him, what do you think? And he said, well, the law is not really about the truth. So I said, why do you say that? Well, he said, it's, it's, it, it just seems to me like uh, it's about who tells a better story. In this case, the defense told a better story. I was persuaded by it, but I'm still not, I still think that he may have done it. He could have done it. And so I said, wow, you know, after 18 years in the law, I couldn't have put it better. The law is really effectively about storytelling. It is about who tells a better story. It's about who constructs the narrative, who wins, the game of the narrative. As uh, Prasanna said, uh, you know, we understand stories through, through the network of, through the frame of narratives. And uh, effectively, most of what we do deals in that narrative. Uh, and we build it up. I mean, if, if you look at any of the controversies today, you look at the Me Too movement, it's all narratives. And the law then has to find a way to deal with that narrative and to get somewhere close to the truth. We never, we ne we, we never know if we reach the truth, but we get somewhere close to it through a process. And that process, Kathleen Sullivan, who used to be the former dean of the Stanford Law School, put it brilliantly. And she said, what is legal method? It's, she said, well, it's nothing more. It's a branch of rhetoric that gives normative force to interpretation and analysis. It's a set of interpretative techniques of problem solving that disaggregates uh, and orders the messy jumble of facts through which a conflict presents itself. And I thought that's brilliantly put. Right? This is exactly what the legal method is really all about. We deal in versions, different versions. 
we deal in a wide morass of facts. And somewhere through that, we try and construct and create meaning. And that meaning we project depending on what our end is. If I'm a lawyer, I want to support the client's case, then I try and give it a meaning that will support the client's case. And similarly with the opposing lawyer, and the judge then has to figure out, you know, who's telling the better story that comes closer to the truth. Who's spinning me and who's closer to the truth. And for those of you who've seen uh, a classic Akira Kurosawa, uh, Rashomon, you'll know exactly why the truth can always be relative. And the truth will always depend upon who's saying it, right? The subjectivity of truth, the relativity of truth, and there are many versions of the truth, especially in cases. And Rashomon is again a case. There was a murder. And the question is, um, who, did, who committed the murder? And there are different versions of it. If you see the movie, it's brilliant. It's one of the most uh, thought-provoking, brilliant movies uh, that was ever made. In fact, that's how Japanese cinema came on, uh, on the mainstream, because of this one movie. Um, and you'll find a lot of pieces also that law professors and many others have written uh, on what they now call the Rashomon effect which is different versions of the same truth. And you find it being referred uh, as early, you know, in a 1993 case, which I incidentally stumbled upon, uh, where the court explicitly says, cases like, and this, interestingly, is a case that comes very close to the present Me Too uh, movement. It's, it's a sexual assault case. Um, and the judge here says, cases like this call upon courts to reenact Roshom. As in the greatest Japanese drama, the characters here all recite their stories with evident sincerity. But is it possible for courts in these cases to get to the truth any more than was possible in the classic Japanese play? And that brings us to an interesting case, uh, which ticks off all the boxes that we wanted, which is that it's a foundational case. It takes us back to the basics. It's got a great story, something that I hadn't realized. You know, when I studied Donahue versus Stevenson, I think we disposed of the, our teacher disposed of the case in what, maybe about 15, 20 minutes, gave us four propositions, the neighborhood principle, duty of care, negligence, and that's it. And then you brought out the entire thing in your paper, and bang. And this is what law school education was, and this is what a large part of education is. I mean, going back to Basant, the, uh, uh, you know, the boy who's now uh, uh, doing his BCom and, and, and from the Bhutan border, uh, interestingly, in his class 11 or class 12, he had an entire section on the dark ages. He had to study for the dark ages. And the teacher had asked him to study out of one of those, what do you call those, dukhis, the guidebooks, of course, written by the teacher himself. And so <laughs> it's a five mark question, and you have to answer, you have to give five points. And the points begin thus. Point number one, the dark ages were dark. Point number two, you know, it started during this phase, and it lasted till this phase. And so you get nothing out of what the dark ages really were, except a set of five principles. And that's how our legal education was conducted as well. You know, five propositions you study. That's what Langdell was upset about as well, right? Just a series of propositions, but no life, no soul, no story. Boring, dry, technical. And imagine the kind of products that come out of this. It's no surprise that we're not very well liked, right? People find us boring. <laughs> There's the reason. We were trained to be this way. So anyway, Basant came back and said, what the, is it, you know, the, was it really dark during the Dark Ages? And I said, well, no, I mean, the Dark Ages were dark to a large part of the Europeans and the Anglo-Saxon view of history. But if you go to Arabia, if you go to India and China, we were thriving during that phase. There were lots of innovations. The Arabs were inventing every day. So were the Indians and the Chinese. It was a golden era in these parts. And so if you have a blinkered view of history and the Anglo-Saxon view, you get the Dark Ages. But the world wasn't dark then, trust me. And then I found a very interesting, again, BBC episode, um, which narrated all of this quite, quite well. And so this boy was very excited because now history became alive to him. He went back and wrote all of this in his paper, and he walked away, and he came back with a one out of five. And, he <laughs> and then he comes and tells me, Sir, you I said, OK, listen. To survive in our educational environment, to be excited about learning, and yet get marks, you have to be a bit schizophrenic. <laughs> which means you give the teacher what they want, which is easy now. Now that you've understood, you've brought alive, you can easily give them the five points. So give them the five points. But you walk away with the real script, the real story. 
the intellectual excitement that came with your learning. Nobody's going to stop that. And that's exactly what you need to do, right? Unfortunately, till the time our system changes. So Donahue, we studied in a dry, boring, technical way, duty of care, that's it. And then as we were investigating as to how to change legal pedagogy to make it more exciting for our students, to build them into legal leaders, creative thought leaders, we said, how do we now pick on a basic case, make it so exciting that the person will never forget it? And also not just teach them the case, but contextually show them that that case teaches them a lot about the law and life. And Donnie, you surprisingly ticked off all those boxes. It's an amazing case. I don't know how many of you have really read it. How many of you are familiar, familiar with Donnie? Apart from those three tick boxes. Okay, good. At least we have three to four hands. Good. So Donnie, you, the classic narrative is that it was one of the foundational tort law cases. It effectively crystallized the law of negligence in a fundamental way that revolutionized tort law. Tort law, unfortunately, has not picked up very well in India. But if you look at the United States, it's what made the law. It's what made lawyers. It's what made the ambulance chasers. It's what made uh, a lot of money for this profession, for tort law, because they granted out damages for everything you could sue, right? Spill a cup of hot coffee, <clears throat> well, you got someone to sue. And it was done in the US. McDonald's was sued because somebody spilled hot coffee. Uh, and they settled for a huge sum of damages. So tort law has gone a bit amok in the, in the US, but the foundational basis was laid uh, in England. Uh, and one of the foundational cases was really this. Um, and in this case, uh, the judges articulated what they called uh, a very loosely uh, as the neighborhood principle. They said, well, you have a duty of care to any neighbor to not harm them. Fundamentally, that's what the case is about. The facts of the case were that uh, two friends went uh, to a cafe late at night in Scotland um, and asked for a ginger beer. Now, again, a ginger beer is not really beer, for those of you who are familiar with your drinks. Uh, may have about 0.5% alcohol, but it's not really beer. They call it ginger beer. Again, it's an IP kind of thing. It's branding, uh, because the moment you call something beer, more people will buy it. But it's really just ginger extract and uh, carbonated stuff. Um, and this ginger ale uh, was also a kind of a float, uh, which in those days was very popular. Again, uh, there's a sub-story within the main story, and there are a lot of sub-stories within this main story. But the sub-story is, uh, you know, this was a bit of a fad, a food fad at that point, where you would actually have ice cream, uh, and you'd had a carbonated drink. So it, it's called a float, because the ice cream sort of floating on the ginger ale. And that's what they had. They had a bowl of ice cream, and then you pour the ginger ale on top of it, uh, and you call it a float. Uh, and uh, so I did a little bit of research, and I found out, well, the float was patented. <laughs> so you have an interesting IP angle there as well. And the float was patented, and the float came into being out of sheer accident because somebody didn't have ice. At that point, they were serving carbonated drinks, uh, and people liked it chilled. And there was no ice. There was only ice cream. So I just put some ice cream in there. And the person who happened to be a guinea pig said, wow, this tastes good. And slowly there was a demand, and then you have the float, which now I believe is being served in some cafes in India as well. Right? I mean, I've not had it here. Uh, but, uh, but that's the story of the float. So anyway, the ladies ordered this really nice ginger beer float. Um, and uh, on their second helping, they found inside the ginger beer bottle, when it was poured, there was a partly decomposed snail. And as a result of which, Mrs. Donahue, uh, went into a state of shock because obviously you know, she had already gulped down part of the ginger beer. And now to find that there was actually a snail inside it, kind of threw up and suffered uh, later, as we are told, uh, gastroenteritis, and then said somebody must pay for this. Um, she couldn't sue the cafe owner uh, because she hadn't bought the ginger beer, her friend had. Um, and also the cafe owner said, it's not my fault. It was an opaque bottle. I bought it directly from the manufacturer, uh, Stevenson. Right? Stevenson's a manufacturer. I bought it directly from the manufacturer. I had no way of examining what was inside. It was sealed and it was opaque. So because I had no way, I'm not liable. She wasn't satisfied, but she was also very poor. Uh, she was struggling to make ends meet. She was separated. Um, 
Fortunately for her, she found a pro bono lawyer, somebody who was hell-bent on making manufacturers pay. So you can also see how this story, this is a 1932 case. So the events happened maybe in 1928, 1927, but a lot of what happened then uh, repeats itself. You know, it's almost like history repeats itself. So if you look at pro bono lawyering today, it's a similar kind of cut that you see, right? So you have this one lawyer who's going after manufacturers. His earlier three cases were slightly similar and somebody actually suggested that this person may be putting up people on these false cases. Because the earlier three cases also were mice inside some drinks, you know, little animals inside beverages. Uh, and it just was too similar um, to be true. So there was some suggestion that this was, this was a person who was kind of constructing some of these cases. And even with Donahue, we'll never know, because the case never went to trial. So you never know if there was actually a snail or not, whether she actually had gastroenteritis. Uh, because when the case was decided, it was decided as a matter of law. Parties stipulated as to the facts. They said, okay, let's assume the facts are correct. We only debate on the issue of law. Is there liability here or not, assuming the facts to be true? Because the defense was pretty uh, confident that they would win the case because uh, as per existing precedent, at least on a facial reading of it, you could not pin down legal liability on a manufacturer. The law of contract was more well developed then. And tort law was just a very messy, wide assortment of individual ad hoc cases. There was no general principle. In fact, this was the first case that brought about a general principle, and that's a beauty and that's a creativity of the judge in this case. Uh, to stitch it all together and to build one unifying core principle. So the defense attorney, obviously the defense hired good attorneys, knew that this was a winner. So they said, well, well, we'll accept the facts. Now let it go on an issue of law, which is are we liable or are we not? And so the, the, the lawyer who picked it up, and she filed as a pauper, so she didn't have to pay court fees. Uh, the lawyer who, 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 who filed the case, uh, had done three earlier cases, all of which were unsuccessful. In fact, the last case that he did uh, involved mice, uh, and the court very clearly said, sorry, no liability, we can't pin down, uh, because there is no contract, and we cannot pin down liability on manufacturers uh, just, just like that. I mean, the only doctrine that they recognized till that date was something called the dangerous goods doctrine, or fraud. So fraud in the sense that I know that a product is defective, I have knowledge, and I still don't want the consumer. Which means, uh, as a manufacturer, I knew there's a defect, I have failed to warn the, uh, the, the consumer, the consumer consumes it, um, gets damaged in the process, they can sue. The second exception is, is it inherently dangerous? So if it's explosives or other goods that are inherently dangerous, then you have a cause of action. These were the only two known instances. Now, the main decision was delivered by Lord Atkin, and he was supported by two other judges. It was a very narrow victory, as you can see, Tankerton and Macmillan, <clears throat> and the dissent was by two judges, Buckmaster and Tomlin. And the, the reason why this became so popular, uh, and that's the interesting part of the story, as to how the judges came up, how especially Atkin drove the decision, because Atkins is the main judgment, and Atkins is the widely cited proposition. Uh, all three of them wrote decisions, right? Uh, but Atkins' uh, duty of care neighborhood principle is the one that we read about in the textbooks because there is a certain elegance about the way he expresses it. And you can see that um, if you look at legal prose, it's actually constructed quite well uh, in the way that he frames uh, the issue and the way he frames the legal proposition. And so Atkins, uh, the key challenge for Atkins was trying to evolve some kind of a common principle but also trying to make sure that people didn't think that he was a revolutionary, um, I think he was a revolutionary that didn't adhere to precedent. Because remember, this is still a common law country, you still have to adhere to precedent. Um, and the question always is, can a judge be creative in the light of precedent? Right? Because if you're stuck with what an earlier judge says, then how do you maneuver yourself around it? Because you know that what that other judge said is wrong, or what the judge, judge said will not help you in this particular case. Atkins very cleverly distinguished earlier case law. But at the same time, he also wanted to lay down a general principle that would govern future cases. Because the 
The tricky part is if you make it too narrow and you make it too fact specific, then all it takes is for a future judge to come and overrule what you've done. Right? This is what happens in ad hoc lawmaking when it's too case specific, when you don't have a general principle, then judges can go anywhere they want. They can distinguish saying that, well, this facts are separate, these are separate, there's no general principle, and that's how tort law was for a long time till now. The other interesting part about Atkins, and I'll give you a little bit of the background, is that Atkins is a very devout Christian. And Atkins' diaries were discovered much later after this case. If you look at the diaries, it's very startling, but he was looking for a case like this. He almost made up his mind. And so it tells you something about legal realism, right? The, you know, the legal realists always spoke about this, that don't bother reading about the law in the books. The law is effectively what the judge tells you it is. And what the judge tells you on that particular day will depend on what he ate for breakfast that day. Right? Too heavy a breakfast, too much gas, and you got a rotten ruling coming out. Right? He's in high spirits, nice, beautiful day. Good attorneys, good session in court, you have a beautiful ruling coming out. So Atkins effectively knew where he wanted to go with the case. And Atkins was also very smart as a judge. He took people along. He knew he needed a three majority. He knew the ones that wouldn't go along with him. He worked with the others and evolved the principle that he wanted. Right? So it's also a lesson uh, which a lot of our judges practice. Right? I mean, you have different judicial philosophies today, different judicial personalities. And Atkins embodies uh, some of the good virtues uh, that we might want to see in our judges, which is taking other people along. Um, now, did he predecide this? I think to a certain extent, yes. Uh, was it good or bad? I mean, again, I think uh, a lot of the good judges and the best of judges that you see today, uh, a lot of them prejudge, a lot of them predecide. They keep an open mind, but I think after hearing the basic facts, they have a broad hypothesis and they work with that. And we can't avoid it. We're all human at the end of the day. And you see that with Atkins as well. So Atkins said, you know, this case, uh, it cannot be that this case, this poor lady who's separated from her husband, who's a pauper, who's been damaged by the gross act of negligence. I mean, imagine a snail inside a ginger ale, right? I mean, we're not talking about a speck of dirt or dust or an ant even, right? Ants are okay. I mean, we get those in our sugars and our jars every now and then. We swig a little bit of the sugar, the ant goes in, does nobody any harm, much harm. But a snail and a partially decomposed one. Now, it's almost, uh, it's clear that there was some negligence. We can't pin it down because only the manufacturer knows what their processes are. And at that point in time, the processes are not so well documented and not subject to so much discovery that you can actually bring it before a court and say, well, there is action. So, I mean, you have to assume at some stage that if a snail got into a, an opaque bottle, uh, there has to be a problem with the process itself. And Atkins was uh, very keen on pinning liability. So he said, let me borrow from the Bible. And the Bible gives you a good story again, the story of the Good Samaritan. Right? And I, I'm guessing that many of you uh, are familiar with that story, uh, which is uh, that a man lay wounded uh, on the roadside. Um, and this is a, in those times, a Jewish neighborhood. And two people walk by, both Jews, and they, when they see the person on the other side, they walk as far away as they can, like many of us do, right? I mean, you see something, some trouble growing up there, somebody needing help kind of go the other way, right? We don't want to see it, we don't want to deal with it. That's exactly what they did. A foreigner, a third party, a Samaritan, who's not from that locality, actually ended up helping. And it was Christ's way of explaining uh, that the good neighbor is actually the one who helps. Right? And if you're meant to love your neighbor, you have to love anybody. Not just the family or the immediate neighbor, but a neighbor is anybody that you see in distress, effectively. But Atkins was also careful and he said, well, the law cannot compel you to love your neighbor, but the law can step in when you harm or you hurt. So can the law mandate you to help in the way that the Good Samaritan does? Again, the case law is very interesting in this because if you look back at what Atkins had evolved then, and now the current spate of case law, there's an interesting 
uh, line of case law that also says you have a duty to rescue. So if you see someone drowning, and if you, if you are technically adept at swimming, okay, let's take the highest stage. You're a, you're, you know, you're a, you're a lifeguard, or it's in your nature of work to actually help people who are drowning. Maybe that's not your terrain, right? You're in a different beach. You're not meant to be on lifeguard, but if you're a lifeguard, the law sometimes imposes a duty on you. If you see someone, somebody drowning, to actually go and rescue them, although it's not part of your official duty. Similarly, uh, uh, doctors, if somebody suddenly gets a heart attack on a flight and you're sitting as a doctor, I think in some cases, uh, some of the case law would tell you that you have a duty to rescue. Right? So it takes you closer to the good neighbor principle, but at the time that Atkins articulated this, he said, well, I'm not going to go there right now. I will simply say that you have a duty not to harm. Whether you have a proactive duty to help, we'll leave that aside for the moment, but you have a duty not to harm your neighbor. And a neighbor is anybody that you can reasonably foresee will be impacted by your actions. So you can see where he's going with this, right? Now the dissent, and in fact, even forget the dissent, even the ones who concurred with him were not very happy with the broad proposition. This broad proposition is you owe a duty of care to the neighbor. Neighbor is anyone within reasonable foresight. Right? which means you can plug in a lot of categories of people within this matrix. The other said, well, we, we don't want to stretch it too far. We'll just make it manufacturer's liability. If you manufacture a good, the consumer is your neighbor. The consumer, you will always have inside because you want the consumer to buy it. So let's not do this neighborhood business. Just spin it down on manufacturer's liability. If a manufacturer is negligent, the manufacturer should be liable. But Atkins had the Bible, Atkins had the neighborhood principle, and Atkins was keen on laying down a le general legal proposition. And so you have this very interesting proposition. The liability for negligence, and this is what he says, whether you style it as such, or you treat it as a species of culpa, which is wrongdoing, is based upon a general public sentiment of moral doing for which the offender must pay. So you see where he starts. That here, the, 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 there is, the, there's a moral wrong here. And I want to try and marry the law and morality. This is immoral. I mean, you can't get away by putting a snail, you know, not taking enough care. Now, how do I construct a legal narrative to take care of that moral wrong? Then he says, the rule that you are to love your neighbor from the Bible, the good Samaritan, love your neighbor, becomes in law, you must not injure your neighbor because I can't compel love through the law. But I can force you not to harm. And the lawyer's question then is, who is my neighbor? Right? And he says, you must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee. So reasonable foresight becomes a test for who is a neighbor. People who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I'm directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called in question. What you actually see here is a very clever piece of legislative drafting. I mean, if you were a legislator making a law on negligence, this is how you'd craft it out. That's how beautiful it was. And this is the power of the proposition. And this is why it circulated so well and became the foundational basis for thoughts. Some might say the neighborhood is not even the ratio because if you were to pick the ratio, you'd have to go through all three judgments, right? Not just Atkins. Atkins was the most popular because Atkins was beautiful prose. But the other two were equally compelling, but they were limited and they were just manufacturer's liability. A manufacturer of products which he sells in such a form uh, where he intends them to reach the ult ultimate consumer in the form in which they left him with no reasonable prospect of intermediate examination, right? And in this case, that was the case. There's no big bottle. You can't see inside it. And with the knowledge that the absence of reasonable care will result in an injury to a consumer's life or property, owes a duty to the consumer. Beautiful prose, like I said. And if you go back, there's uh, uh, Sir Arthur, uh, the Oxford Book of English Prose. And somebody asked him, what's the cardinal virtue for judicial prose? What's the biggest thing of judicial prose? What's the first thing you need to look out for? What is strong judicial prose? And he said, persuasion. That's what the Lord does, right? We persuade with our stories, with our prose. 
And Atkins did the same thing in his judgment. He persuaded. And they and they said, somebody called it an outstanding piece of prose and said, in the best prose, whether narrative or argument, we are so led on as we read that we do not stop to applaud the writer. Right? We're so caught in it. Nor do we stop to question it. That's a danger also. So there's been sharp critiques of Acton's judgment saying, he didn't adhere to precedent. He pulled it out of thin air. He legislated. And anyway, this is not the ratio. Neighbor is not the ratio. There are three judges. It's from one. Just because one is so popular, it doesn't become the ratio. Right? And we see this playing out with the Indian Supreme Court every time. Right? Somebody will come up and start a judgment saying, I am unique, and therefore I'm the best, blah, 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 blah. Or somebody else will come up and cite you know, three lines and put it up there, which becomes the most cited, twittered, uh, Facebooked proposition, but that's not the ratio. Uh, unfortunately, we think it's a ratio because it's more circulated, but the most circulated on social media today is not the ratio. And you can see that playing out so many years ago right here. And of course, Atkins is witty too. Right? So he brings in a little bit of wit. Says, it is a prop when he lays down his proposition, he says, it's almost like Sherlock Holmes, it's elementary. Don't even question it. It, don't even, he says, it is a proposition which I venture to say no one in Scotland or England, because this is a Scott case, it came to the House of Lords, nobody in Scotland or England who was not a lawyer <laughs> would for one moment doubt. Said, unless you're a lawyer, you'll doubt it. But otherwise, the common man with common sense would agree to this. Says, it will be an advantage to make it clear that the law in this matter, as in most others, is in accordance with sound common sense. So effectively, here is a judge sitting down, legislating, telling you it's based on common sense, based on morality, it's based on the Bible. And he was very clear that I don't want separate cases. I want to get one unifying principle. And this is how, this, this is why, and, and he expresses it. He's articulate about it. He says, it is remarkable how difficult it is to find in English authorities statements of general application, defining the relation between parties that give rise to the duty. The courts are concerned with particular relations which come before them in litigation. And courts have restricted themselves only to those situations and whether a duty exists in those circumstances. The result is that courts have been engaged upon an elaborate classification of duties. Right? Great for the lawyers because it's difficult to find the law and understand it because there's so many in so many books. But what Atkins does is stitches all together, gives you a general proposition, easy for you and I to understand. In fact, he says, all of us will agree to it except the lawyers. And McCormick writes a, a, a good review of this, and he calls it structured pluralism. He says, Atkins' reasoning just contains a plurality of elements, including precedent, principle, logic, analogy, policy, and pragmatism. And that's the beauty of this decision. It contains all of this. A, and he says, most important, a convincing legal story, setting up a good case for the conclusion reached. Because why? He had already reached the conclusion way before. Oh, hey, take India. Contrast it, and I call it Jugaad justice. Right? You take a Bhopal gas tragedy. I don't know how many of you uh, read it in depth. After theories of legal liability floated, the worst industrial catastrophe, possibly one of the worst in the world. Forget India. Right? We'd never seen anything like it. The judge hands out an interim, you know, uh, an order saying interim compensation. No reasoning. No legal basis, nothing whatsoever. Goes to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court again finally disposes of the matter again. Comes up with a figure, a sum, with no reason. The outlash was so huge that in a one-off, I think, I haven't seen any other case like this, they come up with a decision after handing the award. It's a post-award ruling by the Supreme Court in Bhopal Gas. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. But the decision came after they'd handed out the award because of the public uh, outcry that came up. One, that the award wasn't enough, and two is, what are you basing this on? And so, well, the, this party said this, this party said X amount, so you're the Supreme Court of India supposed to lay down the law, right? But unfortunately, for, for a lot of our cases, it's very quick fix, ad hoc, fact-based, let's dispense with justice here. The almost a kind of a resentment towards articulating a wider theory of application that will build the jurisprudence. And this is a problem for many of us, particularly as law teachers, because where do we find the principle to teach the students? 
The beauty of the law comes through these principles. The science of the law comes through that. Langdell's efforts at infusing rigor can only, and, and case law teaching can only help if you go from the Jugard ad hoc mindset to a more consistent, sustainable, jurisprudence, philosophy oriented approach where some clear norms are laid down and yet we don't see that much. You look at PILs, right? Sadar jokes, somebody filed a PIL, admit it. Kohinoor diamond, admit it. Dinesh Thakur, India's most famous whistleblower goes and says, our drug regulatory system is rotten. You bunch up a piece of chalk, you know, you crush a piece of chalk, go to the drug regulator and say it's an anti-cancer drug, he'll approve you. You just need five doctor certificates saying this is the most ingenious cancer drug ever to have come. It's chalk. But he said our drug regulatory system is that rotten that you can get approval for anything you want. It's a PIL filed. But thousands of annexures didn't admit. Palkiwala's affidavit in the Bhopal case, in fact, was another the Bhopal case is another interesting. I mean, it's a tragic story as it is, but it's a, it's a story nonetheless. I mean, so many elements went into it. And Palkiwala was right, I mean, although he did us a great disservice by going to the American courts and telling them uh, that the American courts shouldn't decide this dispute because Indian courts are well equipped. Because the Americans, when, uh, you know, Union Carbide argued before the American courts when, uh, when, 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 when the affected victims tried to sue that through the government of India, that, well, India is the right forum, you can't come here. And the Indians knew very well that they weren't going to get damages in India, at least as much as the US. The US was effectively, and this was a multinational corporation that controlled its operations from the US. But Palkewal's affidavit in court said, well, the Indian system uh, uh, is actually equipped to handle this mass disaster. Because the kind of discretion and power that our judges enjoy, nobody else has. They can craft any remedy they want. Tort law exists on paper. And he was right about that. It just so happens that we haven't invoked it too frequently, but doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does. It's common law principles. You can bring it into operation anytime. You can potentially get damages. We haven't seen those huge damages. But there's nothing inherently preventing a court from getting these damages. And again, like I said, subtext within the main, the main part of uh, Donahue. So who really was Mrs. Donahue? I mean, her name is cited as May Donahue in the case. But when she was born, it was May McAllister. Post-marriage, May Donahue. Then she was separated while the case was on, a pauper. And post-divorce, she actually went back to her mother's maiden name and called herself Mabel Hannah. Right? So if you, if you look at some of the writings, uh, and people are trying to put together some of this uh, very nice backstories to the case, uh, and this is an old photo um, that somebody had found and, and, and put up of the lady that made this most famous case. Uh, Walter Leachman was the counsel who picked up the case pro bono, sued for 500 pounds in those days, finally settled for 200. Right? Um, we don't know if the snail was there because it never went to trial. Parties settled before that. In the similar, similar way, I say, we never know if there was beer in the ginger beer or not. Most people assume there is. Hardly any. How did the settlement come about in the face of Atkins ruling? They could have asked for 500 given Atkins ruling. Uh, yeah, so, so, so one is I think the legal expenses associated with the trial and on the facts, I think both parties knew that, you know, ga gastroenteritis, shock, et cetera, et cetera. For damages, you have to prove how it really affected. So I don't know if she had all the hospital evidence and the other things to actually take it that far. Uh, I assume that even pro bono counsels are limited in their resources. So at least I thought I've got a good victory here. I'm not going to spend more time uh, prosecuting on the facts. So you must have indicated, you know how it is. I mean, when I go to pro bono lawyers, it's, uh, and, and, and you know, we struggle because, you know, we have a public interest wing uh, at IDI and we file public interest cases. And it's so difficult to get pro bono lawyers who will treat your pro bono case the same way they treat regular cases. Most pro bono lawyers will give you time on that rare Sunday when they have that one hour to spare, which happens like once in six months. Now, this is pro bono lawyering for you in India. I suspect it wasn't very different there, that even lawyers that took up things may not have had the time. So she would have weighed up the options and she would have said, well, you know, I just need the money urgently. And remember, she's also a pauper. She, trial could take uh, long. Uh, trial could be costly, expensive. So I, I, I suspect parties then decided that uh, they needed to settle. Legal creativity, like I said, uh, now, this is how we distinguish precedent, right? 
So there was precedent and there were two exceptions. Dangerous goods said if a good is inherently dangerous, then there is liability. But a ginger, ginger beer, ginger beer is not dangerous. And here's the clever Atkins for you. Atkins says, but it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to me. Ginger beer may not be dangerous, but ginger beer with a decomposed snail is dangerous. Right? So is it a dangerous good? Of course it's a dangerous good. The moment the snail came into that beer, it made it dangerous. So I don't go with these distinctions. I just think we should phrase it in larger terms, which is that this person knew that they were about to injure somebody else because they didn't take good care. Right? They were negligent about it. They were reckless and they need to pay. Also, he shifts it very subtly from object. Earlier, it was about dangerous goods. He now makes it relational, which is neighbor. That's the beauty of it. He takes it away from, makes it a neighbor so that the application is now wider, much wider than a restricted focus on the good. But was it really new what he did? And this is, again, something about creativity that we need to understand, that creativity a lot of times is what Einstein said, right? Creativity is about knowing how to hide your sources. So we don't know if Atkins ever saw this, but he was well read. Man had been to Oxford, he had very well learned, was an excellent lawyer before he came on the bench. In fact, they say that stories played a large part in his life as well, because he spent a lot of time on the Irish countryside with his uh, grandmother, who was a remarkable lady. Um, so women played a strong influence in his life, which may have been one of the reasons why uh, he might have been a little more sympathetic uh, to uh, May Donahue's case. We never know. But all these influences are paying out. And uh, given that he's well read, chances are slightly likely that he may have seen this. But uh, there was a commentary written, Introduction to the Law of Trials, where this proposition was laid out. Every man ought to take reasonable care that he does not injure his neighbor. Therefore, wherever a man receives any hurt through the default of another, Though the same were not willful, yet if, if it be occasioned by negligence or folly, the law gives him an action to recover damages for the injury so sustained. It's an old principle from Roman law, etc., that got distilled down and put into these commentaries. So, and, and I take this to students and I say, go back. Old is always gold. Right? History is important. Because when you look at Donahue and you study it, you'll find the same damn things playing out again. In fact, you can learn a thing or two from that. And if you look at one of the most well-known judges, I think he just retired, uh, Lord Sutton. What's the name, Lord Sutton? Britain's brainiest man? I'm blanking on the name, his full name. Uh, was one of the most well-known barristers in the UK and then went on to the bench, but is also a huge history buff. And has written uh, monumental volumes uh, on history as well. And now he's retired because he wants to go back and, uh, and, and write more history books. Uh, but history. You know, something we never pay attention to again. Uh, when I was in law school, the subject, uh, you know, I personally didn't pay much attention to. Uh, and now I regret. So, I pulled this. so much of richness in just going back uh, and, and, and seeing how these things replay uh, and play themselves out again and again and again. The same script. And if you understand that, it's almost like you can walk into court today and do the same stuff. But here you're just interested in, you know, the latest thing that comes on the table uh, and not not looking at the old stuff, the foundational stuff, the stuff from where the law actually got built. And again, uh, Atkins was uh, comparative in his orientation, so borrowed from US case law. And Cardoso, Justice Cardoso, by, uh, by then had pinned down liability in a similar case involving the negligence of a car manufacturer. And so he says, it's always a satisfaction to an English lawyer to be able to test his application of fundamental principles to the developments uh, by the courts of the United States. And he then compares. And Indian law, that way, is advantageous because I think we're inherently comparative. right? That's a huge advantage that we have in this country. And I think we need to build on that. Uh, if you look, uh, strangely enough, at the US, <clears throat> it's quite insulated to a large extent. Because you know, I think there's, there's, there's some kind of a subconscious understanding that we, we pave the law for law for a lot of the other countries. Uh, who follow us, so let's be as insular as we can. And, we, and you see that operating, whereas I think countries like India are inherently uh, comparative. The story of the descent. Uh, uh, Prasanna, how, how much more time? About 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes? Perfect. Story of the descent. So the descent was actually delivered uh, by Buckmaster, who's again a phenomenal legal mind. But the reason 
it didn't go down very well. In fact, Lord Denning called him a timorous soul. Right? He hated it. And he said Buckmaster could have done one, but Buckmaster was actually uh, a, a, a fiercer and a more legally logical person. I think intellectually, just on logic, I think Buckmaster would have won. But Buckmaster was just too full of vitriol in his dissent. And so the dissent didn't go down with a lot of people. Because he was very sarcastic. In fact, a commentator says almost passionate sarcasm in his judgment. Because for him, it was the no cause of uh, no cause of action under contract, and that's the end of the story. We don't have a general theory of legal liability, uh, a duty of care owed to the world at large, even if it be a neighbour. And the only case law that came close to it, there was no liability where there was a male coach accident, and he went by that case law, and he says, well, and there were two precedents that may have gone against him. And Buckmaster comes up and says, well, the closer we bury them, the better. Right? He uses very strong language. And another commentator, it's not easy to understand the violence of Buckmaster's objection to the appellant's argument, that's Donahue's argument, in purely legal terms. One might conclude that there's an additional extra legal concern or some personal animus at play. For those of you litigate in court, all too familiar, right? Get a bad ruling from a judge sometimes, and you're thinking, hmm, this guy's had it in for me. It's like my, one of my old bosses, I won't name whom, you know, once had a very nasty judgment against him and said, I shouldn't have got him out when I bowled. You know, I played a cricket match a long time ago. <laughs> you never know with these. And of course, Macmillan agreed with Atkins, but Macmillan wrote an autobiography a long time later, and all of them want to take center seats. So Macmillan said, you know, it's because of me that the ruling came about because I did the swing vote. <laughs> I knew we were going to make history, and I did the swing vote. The policy story, do judges make law? <laughs> And I think it's pretty clear what happened here, right? Uh, and you can see it in the judgment. And, but the beauty is that he's explicit about it. Unfortunately, in India, I think they do policy all the time, but they're never explicit. <laughs> if you express, expressly articulate the concerns that motivate you to come up with a legal ruling, I think it's far better for all of us. And that's what happened. In this case, you see that how Atkins situates his ruling on wider policy considerations, both on public health as well as morality. So he's, and he says, because of its bearing on public health and because of the practical test which it applies to the system under which it arises, the liability for negligence is based upon a general public sentiment of moral wrongdoing. Again, very clear about the policy considerations that permeated his conclusion. And then, I do not think so ill of our jurisprudence as to suppose that its principles are so remote from the ordinary needs of civilized society uh, as to deny a legal remedy where there is so obviously a social wrong. So trying to bridge social wrong, morality, and trying to craft a legal remedy uh, that will then bridge them together. Policy style reasoning, we do it often. I think Justice Nariman comes closest to it, at least in his express articulation, possibly one of the few judges. Uh, and if you read, it, his judgments are a delight, I mean, from the Supreme Court. Uh, he did a POSCO case interpreting section two, uh, very interestingly refers uh, to uh, Julius Cohen's theory of judicial uh, legisputation, what they said. And he, and, and he says interpretation is inescapably a kind of legislation. So effectively telling you, don't ask a silly question to just legislate. The moment you interpret, invariably legislate, because words are limited, meanings are, uh, you know, you, you can never anticipate the, the, the wide spectrum of meaning that you can give to uh, a word. But the paradox with India is our judges love discretion, our judges love um, uh, handing out any ruling that they want to, but we've still not developed tort law enough, right? And tort law is the one law that gives judges maximal freedom to do what they want. Right? Of course, the other cases that came in the wake of Donahue much later, you had a Mountain Dew case again, where the mouse went inside in the US, and very interesting. And this, this is a power where the legal defense was so successful that they won the battle, but lost the war. Is that correct? Yeah. So they went in with a very creative legal argument, which was actually founded in facts. They said, well, there was a mouse inside the Mountain Dew drink, and this person came and exposed it one week later. The consumer came up and, and said, I bought this bottle, I opened it. By then a week, at least a week, had gone by since the bottle was canned. At least a week, minimum. And said, well, if a mouse is inside Mountain Dew for a week, it will not last because our Mountain Dew is so potent and so acidic and so powerful that it will crush its skull and make it into a jelly paste. You can imagine what the dust of the consumer was looking at this thing. Yeah, it's due to my bones as I take this damn thing inside, right? But they won the case. 
and they and interestingly their their little ad slogan at that point was yahoo mountain dew it'll tickle you innards and then somebody came up and stuck off the tickle and said it'll rip your innards <laughs> we have an indian close case in fact we asked some of our idea scholars to go and find an indian equivalent uh, and we found that there was uh, dinesh samantha case with a frog in a cup syrup of course uh, the poor chemist uh, got arrested uh, and prosecuted but the drug manufacturer wasn't touched and same case the chemist said well it's a cough syrup and it was sealed uh, and there was a small dead frog uh, when the patient opened it i mean the, the, the consumer opened it and found it no prosecution is yet on the, on the manufacturer and they settled the prosecution with the chemist later so all of this is uh, uh, again like in the larger backdrop of case to case plus uh, and uh, why i say case to case plus is like i said you can explore several other angles apart from the case alone you can take it into a pattern <laughs> angle with the gingerbread float you can also most interestingly use this case as a fulcrum to 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 understand how the law developed right from then on so all your consumer protection law consumer protection essentially came out of these principles food standards law drug regulatory law in fact today most of our laws are getting this regulatory hue and i always tell my students that you have to go in uh, training to become a regulatory stroke policy lawyer i mean the old lawyer who just understands case laws not good enough right today there's a heavy focus on policy or heavy focus on regulation and regulation turns on policy so you can't be just adept at knowing and understanding the law but you have to actually keep framing new norms as you go along there drones today how do we frame theories of liability for drones how do we have regulations for drones and you have to be two steps ahead of the game you have to in fact be a, you know you'll be of great value to your client if you actually set the norm in place so it means go to your policy maker and say you know well we think this is what the norm should be of course obviously things that will help your client right uh, and the interesting question is uh, how valid is the old principle now that we have a lot of statutory law so there's consumer protection law in this it's embedded in a statutory principle that's common law still prevail right uh, and there are interesting debates about that in the us uh, you see part of that in india as well whether the old principles are preempted by modern statutes us tort law has moved beyond negligence in 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 product liability uh, and that's because of economics more than anything else the economics of insurance um and the economics also of judges because us law as it evolved uh, relies very strongly on uh, on 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 economics so the law and economics movement has had a powerful force on the evolution of us law and us tort law particularly um and so the investigation as to whether somebody is negligent or not as a manufacturer is a costly exercise the cost to be borne when something goes wrong is more easily done by a manufacturer who can get insured and so what effectively happened was a lot of states passed laws saying strict liability right we don't care if you were negligent or not if there is a defect let's make you pay because you can anyway pass that cost on to the consumer in the way you price your products and insurance will anyway pick up any claims that come against you so from a very pragmatic economic perspective it made sense to shift it from a negligence oriented regime to a strict liability regime and so a lot of product liability cases in the us now you don't need to establish negligence you just need to show that the product is effective and that's the biggest problem for india as well i don't know how many of you follow the jnj hip implant case uh, where hip implants uh, that uh, uh, you know metallic hip implants went horribly wrong uh, resulted in corrosion and uh, metallic poisoning for a lot of patients they need a replacement uh, jnj is a supplier uh, of these and and, and 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 took over a company that actually used to produce these uh, uh, there's liability uh, tort cases in the us that were settled for huge sums millions and billions of dollars cases in india still going on but the interesting part is in india our consumer protection act is still relying on negligence to a large extent if you read it uh, carefully you can't claim damages unless you establish negligence um so will we go from here uh, to uh, to strict liability within the consumer framework i think there's a new consumer bill Uh, on the anvil those of you who practice consumer law and maybe ashok can tell us more about it uh, i think there is a slight move towards taking it uh, towards strict liability and a lot of these laws really came even ip law i tell my students had its genesis in donahue because if you look at passing off passing off is very very uh, strongly based on consumer protection not to deceive the consumer the consumer is harmed because he picks up a nike think it's a nike when it's not a nike right 
And the course that we put together says, from Donahue to drugs, drones, and data privacy, because it's the one principle of Donahue that permeates even when we look at liability in the context of drones uh, and data privacy in Aadhaar. And this is another, I'll end with the story, I started with the story, so I'll end with the story. So, uh, like I said, we do a lot of public interest work uh, at IDIA uh, because we thought it's a good way to expose our own scholars to public interest work, to get them some clinical style training, uh, and to interface with lawyers and others. And we started filing a bunch of cases. One of the cases that we filed, and I have two of my colleagues here with me, Ishwar and Bhavya, both of whom are, are uh, public interest fellows. Uh, so most of their work is actually around taking uh, you know, kickstarting public interest litigations uh, and taking it through. So one of the things that we did was uh, on Aadhaar. Uh, <clears throat> and we looked around and we said, uh, the Supreme Court case was on constitutionality. Uh, but nobody was really going after the authority for the massive privacy breaches that were being committed. And each time the UID, uh, UIDAI, the authority, would come back and say, well, there's no breach. Right? Every time a breach took place or uh, was reported, uh, you know, such as the fact that uh, Rachna Khaira coming up in the Tribune and telling you that for 500 rupees, uh, somebody was selling all of your other data uh, electronically. You know, I could get, I could get a disk with all of your other data for 500 rupees. Another thousand rupees, uh, I could get much more than that. Uh, and the authority comes back each time and says, no, no, data is safe, biometric data are not hacked, we have a five foot wall, it's thick concrete wall, you can't breach this, and therefore electronic data is safe, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and, and we looked around and we said, how do we pin liability? Uh, and when we did our initial spate of research, uh, I remember the first public interest fellow who's no longer with us, he's gone for his LLM, he came back to me and said, sir, we, we, we don't have any remedy here because the statute is a bit self-serving. The statute says only the other authority can sue itself. Right. You can't take action. Right. The statute says the, uh, to take action for any breaches, the other authority has to initiate, more will initiate action against itself. It's like harakiri, right? I mean, it is suicide. And uh, well, and suicide is, uh, the attempt to suicide is still a criminal wrong in India. So uh, you know, they might get arrested on that count too. But they're not going to take action. So then I said, what about, what about beautiful old common law? Right. When, you, when everything shuts itself out, I always say, beautiful old common law. You'll always find an answer there. And then, uh, you know, I, I looked around and I said, brilliant. Again, disposed of in one proposition that we wrote about in a question paper years ago, with something called breach of statutory duty. Right? And it's a tort. So the statute gives you duties. Statute doesn't give you a remedy. You can still sue under common law, under tort, saying there's a breach of statutory duty. And that's exactly what we did. We filed a case and we said, there is a statutory duty under the Aadhaar. The Aadhaar Act is beautiful because it lays down the duties quite well. In fact, we even argue that it goes beyond negligence. It casts something similar, something very close to strict liability on the authority to protect and to secure the information that it holds. It doesn't give you a remedy, but for that you don't need the act. You can go to common law and say, well, there's a separate tort called breach of statutory duty. And it's been invoked once or twice earlier in India. And so we used exactly that. And we said, uh, and uh, the case is still ongoing before the Delhi High Court, but hopefully we will help resuscitate an old common law doctrine to help us in this day and age uh, of Aadhaar and data privacy. So with that, thank you very much uh, for your patience. Thank you. I know there are going to be a lot of questions, but we really have run out of time. And um, Shamnad will be, of course, around. You can continue to have a conversation with him. And um, he's here and he's going to be with us during lunchtime as well. Sometimes I can't express adequately the kind of appreciation that we have for the presentation you made. And may I request all of you to please join.